The New Testament lesson from Luke chapter 24, the resurrection of Jesus. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But those words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But, then, but Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. Together he went home and amazed at what had happened. A New Testament lesson. Our epistle reading comes from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16. I have good things to say about Phoebe, who is a leader at the church in Cancheria. Welcome her in a way that is proper to someone who has faith in the Lord and someone who was one of God's own people. Help her in any way that you can. After all, she has proved to be a respected leader for many others, including me. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila. They have not only served Christ Jesus together with me, but have even risked their lives for me. I am grateful for them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Greet the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend Epinatus who was the first person in Asia to have faith in Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked so hard for you. Greet my relatives, Andronicus and Junius, who were in jail with me. They are highly respected by the apostles and were followers of Christ before I was. The word of our Lord, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I ask that you would pour out your presence and your spirit upon us in a mighty and powerful way, that you would open up our ears and our hearts to hear your word proclaimed to us. In Jesus' name, amen. First, a bit of a story. It was about five years ago during a pretty regular presbytery meeting. And if you're not so familiar or interested with the inner workings of church government, it probably wouldn't appeal to you. A presbytery meeting is a lot like watching C-SPAN, since our national government is built largely upon the Presbyterian model. So influential were the Presbyterians that King George referred to the Revolutionary War as the Presbyterian Revolt. Yet within this drab and common meeting, lay a beautiful treasure that often happens when Presbyterians meet together. See, when Presbyterians gather, they pray, they worship, they ask God to guide their hearts, their minds, their decision-making, like a common oyster hiding an exceptional gem. This particular Presbyterian meeting held a pearl of great price. During our worship, we were invited to come forward. We were bid frontward to remember our calling as disciples and as Christians, to remember our call as pastors or as lay leaders, to remember our baptism and our part in God's covenant with his dear and beloved children. 
and to receive a blessing from one of our colleagues. We've done something similar here at Clinton Presbyterian from time to time. There were multiple stations scattered throughout the sanctuary to choose from, but, but one line quickly grew longer than all the rest. It wasn't based upon geography or proximity to where people were seating, but upon the person who was doing the blessing. She was the pearl of great price, a gem in the shimmery crown of the Presbyterian Church USA. She was Margaret Towner, the very first woman to be ordained as a pastor in our denomination all the way back in 1956. I stood up with my colleagues and patiently waited my turn for Margaret's blessing. Sure, there were other stations that did not have a line, but those stations didn't have Margaret. As we stood up, we were hungry for Margaret's blessing, much like Esau and Jacob were hungry for the blessing of their father Isaac. But unlike Esau, not one of us who stood up to receive her blessing came away empty-handed. We each received Margaret's blessing and the reminder that we have an amazing denomination which has often stood up for the rights of the disenfranchised and the marginalized. Presbyterians have long stood up to fight against discrimination. We stood up shoulder to shoulder in Selma fighting for equality. We stood up in Washington denouncing McCarthyism and xenophobia. We stood up for women fighting for their right to be church elders, which happened in 1936. Recently, we stood up with communities torn by racial divisions like Ferguson and New York and Baltimore trying to bring peace and reconciliation. But our Presbyterian legacy of standing up extends beyond this century. Presbyterians stood up in Philadelphia, waiting their turn to sign the Declaration of Independence. And they stood up before that in places like Geneva and Scotland for free public education. Perhaps our legacy of standing up to speak to liberty and freedom goes back to Jesus. When at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he went to the synagogue in Nazareth, as was his custom. And there, the good doctor Luke records what happened in chapter 4 of his gospel. Jesus stood up in front of the people, and he unrolled the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus stood up and proclaimed liberty and good news. This morning, as I stand up before you, I want to share with you some of the good news proclaimed by women in Scripture as a way to honor some of the important women in my life and in our congregation. Few scenes in Scripture are likely as emotionally powerful for Mother's Day, especially, than the image of Mary standing up at the base of the cross looking up to the face of her son Jesus. Mary, a woman of unconditional faith, a woman by whom we all have received the ultimate blessing, Jesus. In John 4, we can picture the woman at the well who was arguably the first evangelist standing up in the town square calling out to the very people who condemned her and said, this man told me everything I have ever done. This is the Messiah. And scripture tells us that many people came to faith in Christ because of her 
Then there's Mary Magdalene. All four of the Gospels share that Jesus first appeared to whom? To the women. Listen closely. As I share the account from Luke, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came. The women came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. The women found a stone rolled away from the tomb, but when the women went in, the women did not find the body. While the women were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not risen. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified on the third day, rise again. The angels say, remember how he told you. It's not remember what your husband or remember what the male disciples taught you. It's not remember what you overheard. It's remember what Jesus told you. Jesus taught them. Jesus taught them, the women. The women were just as much followers and disciples of Jesus as the men were. And there the women are, standing up. Faces bowed towards the ground, but standing up with the angels. And then the women go. And Mary Magdalene goes to the men who were in hiding. They go to the men who were in hiding. And she stands up. Mary stands up in front of them for the first time passing human lips. Says, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And the men, they don't believe her. They don't seem to recall the teaching of Jesus. But they were there in Galilee too when Jesus stood up in front of them and shared that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Later we read that the church was blessed by Lydia who was a successful businesswoman who sold purple cloth. Lydia was the spiritual head of her household as upon hearing the preaching of Paul, she stood up and asked him to come and baptize her whole household. She didn't ask her husband to do it. She did it. She also supported Paul financially. Paul also acknowledged Junius, who was in prison for standing up with him, preaching the gospel, as well as Typhinia, Tryphosa, and Persis, and other women who stood up to answer the call of ministry. Paul describes them as women who work hard for the Lord. In our other text today, Romans 16, we learn about Phoebe, Paul's words. I recommend to you Phoebe, our fellow believer, who is a minister of the assembly in Cancaria, so that you will admit her into your company, the Lord's company, in a manner worthy of the people devoted to God, and stand by her in whatever matter she needs you to help in. For indeed, she became a presiding officer over many and over me too. Wow. In the Greek, Paul describes Phoebe as both a prostasis, which is a benefactor or a patron, and a deacon. His word for pastor. Phoebe was a minister in Cancaria, a small town near the port of Corinth, a very difficult place to minister. But beyond all this, she was Paul's emissary to Rome. Phoebe was the one who was charged with carrying Paul's letter, his epistle to the Romans, to Rome. Think about it. Phoebe was the first person, male or female, to proclaim from, to preach from Paul's letter to the Romans. It was Phoebe who stood up in Rome and proclaimed Paul's word to them. You might not have been blessed by Margaret, but you have certainly been blessed by the ministry of women who have stood up 
in ministry and service to the church over the years. Our church is no exception. Nearest I could tell it was 1967 when you had your first class of elders with women who were ordained, and that included Edna Rao, Mary Kelp, and Elizabeth Kraft. We've been blessed to have women leading this church throughout the years with their gifts as elders and as deacons, and have been blessed to have the interim ministry of Pastor Charlotte and the installed leadership of Pastor Samantha, who preaches in this very pulpit every week. For many women, especially younger ones, seeing other women stand up and take their place in church leadership helps to open the floodgates of their call. They see role models and trailblazers, women they can relate to standing up to proclaim the good news of the gospel. That's something we should celebrate as a denomination. See, too often, far too often, in far too many denominations, women have been told to sit down. They've been told to sit down. Don't answer the call from the Holy Spirit. Sit down. Sit down. Let the men folk do it. As we stand up and celebrate the gifts of women today, we must also to continue to advocate for women who are voiceless. Those women who have been told to sit down. Proverbs, Proverbs 31.8, which is on a godly woman, so speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. So today I stand up for the women who are victims of domestic violence. I stand up for the women who are stuck in tra sex trafficking. Today I stand up for the women who have been told to sit down and who have been treated as second class citizens for far too long. Almost 2,000 years ago, Paul told us that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Hear those words and let them sink in. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Hold that especially in light of Proverbs 31.8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Friends, we are all one in Christ Jesus, and we need to stand up for our sisters who are persecuted, belittled, victimized, who live in fear. When I was in seminary, I had a patient who struggled with significant depression. She lived in a group home, and throughout her life she had been repeatedly sexually assaulted and molested. She lived in so much terror that she wanted to become a man so that people could no longer assault her. So she asked me as her chaplain if I could pray for her to wake up one day as a man. I can't imagine the depth of her pain or her fear. I tried to comfort her the best I could and the staff continued to work with her while she was with us. They discharged her. I told them I didn't think she was ready. She wasn't. A week later, she stood up. She stood up on the side of a bridge overlooking the Mississippi River near the Quad Cities. And she jumped. We need to speak up, to stand up for women who are trapped in abusive relationships. According to the statistics, globally 35% of women will experience physical or domestic violence. That's one out of three folks. And it's as high as 70% in some countries. More than one in three women and more than one in four men in the United States have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. Sex trafficking affects 4.5 million people worldwide. Friends, that's not okay. And we need to stand up. 
First, if you're in an abusive relationship, get help. If you're an abuser, get help. Our church has long been a supporter, and I was a former board member of Dove Inc. here in town, which helps women and men in domestic violence. Call them. Their number is posted throughout our church. Also, the number for the National Domestic Hotline is right up here on our screen. It's also in your bulletin this morning. And Pastor Samantha or I will help you connect with them if you need us to. Be a role model. We are blessed through the gift of many women and men who are willing to stand up and be a role model for women's rights. Teach boys and young men to respect girls and women like my father taught me. And men, I'm talking to you. We need to stand up to use our voice and say loud and clear that violence against women and girls is not in our name and that we're man enough to stand up and be counted. You can consider wearing orange on the 25th of each month. The United Nations designated the 25th of each month as Wear Orange Day to draw attention to women's rights and their situation throughout the world. I have a bow tie that's orange that I like to wear just for that occasion. I try to wear it on the 25th. Finally, stand up and support the education of girls and women locally and globally. Poverty and poor education often trap victims in the cycle of violence because they have no options. Friends, we are blessed to be part of a congregation and part of a denomination that stands up and celebrates the gifts of women. It's something to be proud of. It's something to stand up for. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you sent your Holy Spirit to rise up women and men to all offices in your church and to proclaim the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to a world that is broken by sin and torn apart by divisions, ethnic, gender, racial, financial. Grant us spiritual gifts to share our love with you, with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Give us boldness and courage to speak up and stand up for those who are voiceless, and by doing so, love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. And now will you stand up with me as we read together our affirmation of faith taken from the Presbyterian Church's brief statement of faith on the Holy Spirit. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves, to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture.